Well, comrades, I think when it comes to the Ukraine war, there's one thing that sums up everything uh, in the West more than anything, which is that everything we've been told has been a lie from beginning uh, to end. And it's a lie that's been designed to dupe the working classes into supporting a, a, a reactionary, cynical, barbaric proxy war on the part of Western imperialism. We were told that this was a struggle, it was, it was a war between good and evil. It was between democracy and dictatorship. It was between Western values, you know, uh, uh, human rights and so on, and this brutal, evil Russian uh, barbarism that, that Vladimir Putin supposedly represented. And everything else Russian, by the way, that's also evil, uh, apparently. Um, if you remember, you know, if this, this might not be, you know, fresh in your memory, but every time there was a single civil, civilian casualty in, in Ukraine, they would raise a hue and cry about it. Oh, look at how uh, Putin would bomb hospitals and, you know, the, the children would die and women and children would die and so on and so forth. But, but yeah, look at, look at uh, what Israel is doing uh, today. You know, mercilessly, you have this, one of the most advanced military machines in the world, mercilessly bombing and killing and you know, destroying this, this, uh, this, this defenseless population, thousands of Palestinians being killed. Not only that, not only are they bombing civilians, they're purposefully bombing civilians. They want to terrorize them. They even state they want to terrorize them so these people will leave. They're trying to kill as many as they possibly can. And within the past couple of weeks, they've already killed far more than the official uh, uh, count of civilian deaths in the whole in the whole totality of the Ukraine uh, war. Um, yeah, and if you remember, you know, every time some Russian, I remember there was there was there was a Russian official who called Ukrainian government officials for cockroaches, and there was a big hoo ha in the Western media. Oh, this is genocidal language. As a matter of fact, they are cockroaches, but we'll, 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 get, we'll get to that. And there's nothing genocidal in, 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 in calling uh, uh, Ukrainian state officials that. But then you have the Israeli defense minister calling Palestinians human animals and essentially, uh, you know, uh, 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 calling for them to be ex exterminated. And nothing is being done. On the contrary, all of those who are howling along about, uh, about the Russian barbarism and so on and so forth, are fully behind the Israeli military machine and its onslaught against the, the, the Palestinian uh, people. It's, it was all lies, <laughs> in other words. You know, they, they, talk, they talked about the forces of good versus evil and how NATO is this defensive, it's just a defensive pact, it's just a collaboration to defend Western values and Western democracy. But if you look at the history of NATO, there's, there's never been anything uh, 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 um, defensive about it. The way that they destroyed uh, Yugoslavia in the 90s, the way that they destroyed uh, Afghanistan, uh, more recently killing hundreds of thousands of people. In Libya, they completely destabilized, NATO's intervention completely destabilized the country. A country which was relatively stable with a high level of culture is now just, you know, uh, uh, in the throes of barbarism with all sorts of is is Islamist militias and so on uh, vying for power. And of course, other, other adventures of, of U.S. imperialism and British imperialism. We know about the Iraq war. In Iraq, they killed, well, some, some, some figures put it in, in more than one million people. Imagine, pile up all of those dead bodies on top of one another. And you, you, you know, just imagine that, how much death and destruction these forces, at the heart of NATO, how much they've, uh, they've caused uh, on the world. In Yemen, for, for years, for 10 years, They've been destroying this. This is one of the poorest countries in the world. Hundreds of thousands of millions of people are living on the edge of starvation. Hundreds of thousands are dying. And who's been uh, leading the charge? It's been the Saudis, supported by U.S. imperialism and British imperialism. These are not peaceful, defensive uh, 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 forces. They're aggressive imperialist forces who try to uh, 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 subdue and dominate as much as the world as they possibly can for their own interests. You know, they talked about, oh, the, the, the Ukrainian right for self-determination, the, the Ukrainian people must be uh, defended and so on. But, it, but recently, in order to have Sweden join NATO, they made a deal 
<laughs> with the Turkish regime, uh, essentially to sell out the, the Kurds, the oppressed Kurds who are oppressed by the, by the Turkish regime, are now being hounded down and the organizations are being dismantled, they're being imprisoned, they're being handed over by this peace-loving, social democratic, socialist, Scandinavian socialist country, uh, 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 Sweden. NATO is not a defensive force, it's never been so. It's an aggressive imperialist force, mainly in the interest of US imperialism, which is the most reactionary force on the planet. Uh, and that is how we need to understand uh, this war. Now, of course, we don't take sides in this war. This is a reactionary war on both sides. But it's not a war between U Russia and Ukraine. It's a war between U.S. imperialism on the one hand that uses Ukraine as its proxy and uh, a Russian capitalism uh, uh, on the other hand. And it just so happens that this war is being fought on Ukrainian soil. But essentially, it's a war between the U.S., uh, and, and Russia, and you have, you have reaction on both sides. And the task of the communists, the, the, the task of the communists is precisely not to support any of the ruling class, any of the reactionary cap uh, capitalist forces uh, in this war. And for us as Western capitalists, well, all, sorry, communists, <laughs> and for all communists, is to, is to oppose our own ruling classes. The main, our main enemy, our first enemy is at home in other words, and our task is to fight our own ruling class and the role that it plays in this uh, reactionary um, uh, endeavor. Yes, but we're told, but it was Russia that started the war. That's, you know, they, they, they were the ones who invaded and, the, you know, Ukraine was such, such a <laughs> defenseless and, you know, harmless uh, 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 country. And it's true that formally Russia fired the first shots of this particular incident, this particular part of the episode of, of uh, sorry, uh, of the, uh, the history of uh, Ukraine. But that's not the entire story. In fact, in a war, it's never really important who fires the first shots. And if we go back a little bit further, we see the, 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 the role of the US imperialism and of NATO throughout all of this, which has been one of provoking aggressively and, and encroaching on uh, Russia again and again. You see, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the West made a deal with the with the Russians. They said, "Look, if you dismantle the uh, uh, Warsaw Pact, which was a defensive pact that the, that the Soviets had with Eastern Euro in Eastern Europe, then we will promise you that we will not expand NATO into Eastern Europe. I will not expand military bases and military collaboration with Eastern European countries." And there's like, there's plenty of uh, documentation for this. But again and again throughout the years, NATO expanded, bringing one country after another into its fold. And at, this, at that time in the 90s, Russia was a very weak country. It was a weak capitalist country. It was, its economy was is collapsing. Its army was collapsing. The state apparatus, everything was rotten through and through. And well, in, in essence, it was actually dominated by, by, by US imperialism. It was kind of a semi-colony, if you may a domain of Western imperialism, at least to a, to a large uh, degree. And they couldn't do anything about the expansion of, uh, of NATO. Um, however, throughout this period, it was clear that Ukraine was a red line for this. Why is that? Ukraine has a very, the Ukraine is an independent country, but in, in reality, the Ukraine and the rest of Russia has a very, very long common history and there's like a brotherly, between the Ukrainian and Russian peoples, there's a brotherly relationship. Um, but also from a capitalist basis, there is a, the, the economy of the Ukraine and Russia was, was entirely uh, uh, enmeshed in one another, uh, especially the, uh, the armed industry, the uh, lots of you know, mining, um, what do you call it, um, agriculture, uh, aero, what do you call it, aerospace uh, industry and so on. A lot of the major components of, of these industries were in Ukraine. <coughs> there's, a, there's obviously a geographic component. The Ukraine is right you know, at, the, at the soft underbelly of, uh, of Russia, if, if you may. Russian people and Ukrainian people would visit one another. Lots of Russians would go to Ukraine for holidays. You go to Kiev, you could get along by just speaking Russian. You didn't have to speak any Ukrainian. Everyone spoke Russian. There was no hostility. In, in many ways, it was one peoples and, 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 uh, uh, and, and they had very, very close uh, links with one another. 
That also meant from a capitalist point of view that uh, the Russian capitalists could not saw the, impl the uh, insertion of Ukraine into NATO and in the, how to say, and under the domination of Western imperialism as a direct threat to their interests, economically, culturally, militarily, so on and so forth. Just imagine what would happen if Russia started building loads of military bases in Canada or Mexico, how, how, how the U.S. Would, uh, would, would react, or Cuba, where we did see how they would react. They, they threatened to go through nuclear war when, when the Russians were, um, were, were uh, moving um, uh, missiles to, to, to Cuba. Um, and at the same time, however, in spite of all the notices that this was a red line for, for Russian capitalism, Russian capitalism could not accept a NATO, uh, uh, a Ukraine in NATO uh, and under the Western domination, the Americans kept pushing it and pushing it. There was a struggle over years of coups and counter coups and maneuvers inside the Ukrainian state apparatus where the West, uh, Western aligned forces and Russian aligned forces were essentially fighting one another. And the height of this came in the, in 2014 in the Maidan movement where you had a, you had a mass movement which was essentially hijacked by right-wing uh, liberal pro-Western uh, forces. Um, and, it, and it resulted in one wing of the Ukrainian oligarchy, supported by the CIA, supported by the Americans, as well as uh, important groups of right-wing fascists and ultra-right-wing uh, nationalists, taking power essentially and installing a, an extremely pro-Western um, uh, regime, the Maidan regime, which is, which is the one that's, uh, that's essentially there. That, the, the, the history of the Maidan regime and what happened is a longer one. But suffice it to say that even then, after a period, there was a lots of conflicts, there was lots of instability. You, it led to a civil war inside of Ukraine with the, with the Russian speakers feeling, uh, feeling attacked. Uh, there was uprisings and so on and so forth. Russia intervening in this whole process. But in the end, they made a certain agreement that is called the Minsk II agreement to, again, to collaborate which meant that the Minsk II agreement would mean that, um, that the Russian interests essentially were maintained, that Ukraine did not become a military foothold uh, that could be turned against Russia. This was a deal that was made with the Ukrainian uh, regime, as well as the French and the, uh, and the Germans. Now Zelensky, as you know, today a very popular man, he came to power actually on the promise of implementing that, on, on, the, on the promise, <laughs> of having peace and not non-aggression with Russia, in fact. And he was elected against, originally <laughs> against the Maidan regime. <laughs> he, 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 his, his, uh, uh, his main slogan was against the oligarchs, against the corrupt officials, against the state bureaucracy and so on. However, he is not a man, of, he's not an idealist, he's not a man of principles necessarily. And once he got to power, he was co-opted essentially by a certain wing of the, um, by the oligarchs and continued down the same path. And the main thing in this situation was the Americans refused to have him or anyone else implement the Minsk II agreement. This is not a socialist agreement. This is not a socialist program. This is not a working class program. This is an agreement between two bourgeois reactionary regimes to have peace in the Ukraine so that, and, and it collaborate, it's like a power sharing deal essentially. The Russians say, okay, you can have this and that, we, we just want our guarantees that this is not be, going to become a threat to our interests. But the Americans refused to implement this. They refused to give any concessions whatsoever. Quite the contrary. They whipped up uh, again and again anti-Russian moods inside of Ukraine. The Ukrainian army was rebuilt, remodeled along NATO lines. And the integration of Ukraine into, the, into Western imperialism, into the sphere of Western imperialism, uh, 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 Took, uh, was accelerated in this whole uh, process. The demands, that's what led to the buildup of Russian troops on Ukrainian borders in, uh, what was it, 2021 was it, yeah? At the end of 2021 and early 2022. Uh, and what was Putin saying? We need to implement this, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, agreement. And the Americans rejected that. Now why was that? They knew that Putin did not have any other choice than go to war. They provoked this war consciously. And what was the reason? They thought this would be an easy victory. This would be an easy win for them. One, the, what, what were their war aims? To weaken Russia. Essentially, in the long run, 
to push Russia back in the weak uh, uh, position that it was in in the 90s, i.e. as a subjugated semi-colony uh, uh, of the West, so that, this is not necessarily Im the immediate aim, but in the long run to use Ukraine as a means, as a means of, of weakening uh, Russian capitalism, so that they can focus on China. This was the main aim of, of US imperialism. And the second aim was to divide uh, Russia was to separate Russia from the EU, uh, which relied which relied heavily on Russian gas, which cheap Russian gas, which is a key component in the industry and the economy of, of Germany and, and the rest of uh, the EU, Germany being the biggest economy by far. And in this way to weaken and dominate the, uh, the Europe even further. That was a secondary aim of it. And what was the bonus? You didn't have to shed any American uh, blood to do this. And this is not just us who are saying this. Uh, Mitt Romney, some of you might know, old, uh, good old Republican, as they say. Um, what's, what did he tweet uh, a while ago? He said, Putin's Russia is not our friend, and it is Russia, China's most powerful ally. Supporting Ukraine weakens an adversary, <laughs> enhances our national security advantage, i.e. our power globally, and requires no shedding of American blood. This is, this is the cynicism with which these people embark on this. And this is the responsibility they have for the bloodbath, for the barbarism that's been created in uh, uh, Ukraine. And of course, it's completely backfired, but we'll, we'll get back to that later. And what's been the cost of the war so far? Well, no one knows the exact figures of death, but one thing we know is that recently they made a plan to build a new cemetery in, uh, in Ukraine, which is slightly larger than the Arlington Cemetery in the US, which has 400,000 graves. Some of those, there are some graves that we moved to that, but that shows you the level of death and destruction that we've, uh, that we've witnessed inside uh, of, um, of Ukraine. The, the, the infrastructure has been completely destroyed. Uh, industry has been destroyed. Millions of people have been displaced. They've been forced to move to, uh, to, to other countries. I, just, I think yesterday I read somewhere that a rise of, of uh, uh, Ukrainian homelessness in Europe, in Germany, and, uh, and other places. People who have been, who've, who've had to uh, leave everything either internally displaced or, or had to flee their country uh, altogether. Hundreds of thousands of people have been maimed, lo lost limbs. Uh, and have to live with that. Hundreds of thousands of people have been uh, shell-shocked, you know, suffering from PTSD. And you were going to see generations of people who have to pay for the wounds that are being caused by this war uh, as it is. And all of that for what? For the interest, for the narrow interest of the rich in Washington and their puppets and allies in London and, and, and elsewhere. There was, a, there was a massive wave of propaganda in the West, uh, some of you will remember. And you saw the, a, 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 a genuine mood amongst millions of ordinary people saying, we need to do something. You know, we, is, Ukrainians are being killed. This is, this is not right. We want to help them in any way we can. You saw lots of people taking in Ukrainians. That shows you the real attitude of, the, of ordinary workers. Uh, but what was being done was not what they were being shown. They were being <laughs> led, you know, they were being duped. They were being uh, cheated, in other words. They were being manipulated. How long have I spoken? Uh, kind of 20 minutes. Okay. Um, they were being manipulated. And in reality, the exact opposite w was, was happening. The Ukrainian masses were not being helped. We weren't, they weren't defending a democratic Ukraine. The regime that was built in Ukraine by the West and, the, and their puppets in, in, in Ukraine is everything but democratic. It's an incredibly rotten, oligarchic, and corrupt regime. It has all of the, the hallmarks of, of the regime that they accuse Russia of being, perhaps even a bit more, <laughs> maybe a bit more disorganized, let's put it like that. It's not more, more or less reactionary. But, um, but extremely, extremely corrupt, with a significant element of, of, of fascist groups implemented in, in, in certain parts of it. The, the, it carries um, a uh, Bander, Bandera uh, nationalist uh, nostalgia. Bandera was like a Ukrainian nationalist in World War II, collaborated with, with the Nazis. Um, in its armed forces, it has battalions which are openly Nazis, openly uh, uh, fascist. Um, and at this stage, actually, at, as we speak, in this period, 
every single week there are loads of corruption scandals which 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 just shows a little bit of the rot that exists underneath the surface of uh, of, of the state uh, mobile people receiving a price for mobilization to be excluded from mobilization apparently you can get ex excluded if you pay someone five thousand dollars which is nowhere close to anything that ordinary people would have and as a result there's a there's a joke that if they actually mobilize rich people's children then we would probably have peace by now this is a, this is a joke making the rounds in in ukraine itself recent last week there was an article in times magazine a very prominent article by by a very prominent journalist and uh, he just gave a little uh, example of some of the conversations that he had and said and he wrote amid all the pressure to root out corruption i assume perhaps naively that officials in Ukraine would think twice before taking a bribe or pocketing state funds. But when I made this point to a top presidential advisor in early October, this is not long ago, he asked me to turn off my audio recorder so he could speak more freely and said, Simon, you're mistaken. People are stealing like there's no tomorrow. That's the, that's the type of uh, 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 regime that the US uh, and the West is building in, inside of, of Ukraine. And, I'm, and I'll tell you, there is mass dissatisfaction with this regime. <coughs> and there's, there is a big swing now against what, what they're doing, against the corruption. People can say, look, why are you waging all of these offensives, which are clearly just PR stunts? Why are people, people dying? Why is, why is our lives being ground to a halt? And you have no way of actually guaranteeing us, you, you're just looking after yourself, essentially. Um, and the Ukrainian state is entirely run by, uh, by the Western, by, by U.S. imperialism, by, by the CIA, by the U.S., the U.S. military has enormous influence within the Ukrainian army. The IMF has enormous, uh, control over the Ukrainian uh, e economy. And recently it was, uh, it was leaked <coughs> that, um, in order to get the fun, the, the Ukrainian state is entirely dependent on funds from the West. But in order to receive those funds, the Americans have asked for a huge range of conditions, changing of the law, changing of the legal system, uh, in, in implementation of certain elements, and oversight over the implementation of the budget. What does it mean if another country comes and tells you, I need to have oversight and I need to uh, approve every single change and every th single thing you do to the budget and how you implement it? That means you have full control. That means there's no such thing as an independent Ukraine, <laughs> that, 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 that there is uh, at least not, a, well, not an, there is no independent Ukraine as it is now. Ukraine, the Ukrainian regime, the present one, is a proxy for US imperialism. And therefore, what the war that's being fought is not a war between an independent Ukraine or, or one <laughs> dominated by Russia. It's a war between who is going to dominate Ukraine. That's the only choice in front of, uh, uh, that's the only two solutions two road paths in front of it, uh, this, this particular war. Now, uh, some people <coughs> say, well, the, the solution is peace. We need to have you know, pacifism, essentially. A lot of people say this in a most genuine manner. Some people say it less, uh, less genuinely. But the point, the point is this. War is a consequence of capitalism. War is a symptom of a diseased system. And there's no way that you can, you can, you cannot have capitalism without war. There's, there's those two things that just don't go together. Um, and for our, from our point of view, we are not moralists. Marxists are not moralists. We don't say, of course, no one, we are not in favor of war. We're not in favor of death and destruction and barbarism, destitution. We're not in favor of all of the, any of these things. We want to eradicate them. But the, the way to do it is not by wishing them away and by trying to force the bourgeois into some, to, to be better bourgeois, more peaceful capitalists. That doesn't exist. Um, and furthermore, we are not in favor, in, against all wars. There are some wars that are reactionary, like the present one. There are imperialist wars, but there are also good wars, progressive wars, that are, that are fought by the, by the oppressed masses. The rev a revolutionary war, or a war of national liberation, i.e. a war of the oppressed against against the, the, their oppressors. We support uh, those wars uh, um, as a means to fight against the capitalist system. But we also explain that as long as capitalism remains, there will be a struggle for markets. There will be a struggle for spheres of influence. 
and there will be competition between the bourgeois of different countries, which essentially will propel them into one type of war after another. And, and the, 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 the slogan of peace in that sense, within capitalism, is utopian. And in fact, it's reactionary because it gives the idea that there can be a peaceful capitalism. There is a progressive bourgeoisie or a better type of capitalist, a more peaceful and humane type of capitalism. That such a thing does not exist. And also, um, not only that, but it, it's also reactionary because essentially the slogan for peace means a defense of the status quo. Peace today in Ukraine, on the conditions that we have now, what does it mean? It means a, a Ukraine dominated by, by, by American imperialism as a means to fight and, and, and attempt to subdue Russian, Russian capitalism. That's what peace means today. Uh, and we are not in favor of the status quo. It means a status quo where the exploiters and the oppressors of the Ukrainian people, who are now in power, the Ukrainian ruling class remains in power. That's the type of peace uh, that 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 uh, that we'd be looking at if we're fighting for peace within capitalism doesn't mean that we fight for war, for war either, but these are the objective conditions of capitalism, and the only way to to fight against it is to fight against the system uh, as as a whole. Um, yes, and even if you had peace within capitalism, any peace, any imperialist peace, as Lenin said, is just a precursor for another imperialist war. So as I said, the only real struggle for peace is to, is to struggle for, uh, uh, against uh, capitalism its, itself. Now, what does that mean for communists in the West? What is, what is our task then? Well, first of all, our task is to clarify the class contradictions, is to, is to wish, you know, wash away all of this confusion, the lies and the hypocrisy that is spreading out in, in the mass media, in the education system, and, and so on and so forth, to expose our own ruling classes uh, and their interests, to tell the workers and the youth all of these lies and explain, and explain why are they lying like this? What is it that they're covering? Their class interests, in, in, in other words. Uh, and, and, ex and explain how our class interests are diametrically opposed to those of the ruling class. We need to explain, look, uh, and we need to connect that to the ordinary lives of the workers uh, in, in the West. Look, they are throwing billions and billions, I think it's around $150 billion so far, officially at least, have been channeled into the Ukraine war by Western governments. Well, in the same period, they've been attacking living standards. They've been cutting back at schools. They don't have money for schools. They don't have money for hospitals. Every time there's any discussion of a budget, oh, no, no, we have to be realistic. And we have, but there's money for war. There's money for arms. There's money for killing and, 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 and murdering. Um, and also uh, what Joe explained before, the cost of living crisis. This war has not only destabilized Ukraine, it's actually destabilized the whole world. A huge, a huge part, probably at this stage, the biggest part of inflation today in the world comes from uh, as, a, as a consequence of this war, which has pushed up oil prices, which has pushed up food prices. And again, it's the workers... Uh, of the West that, that are paying the price. And our task is to connect these struggles and to show that these are all connected. Our, our ruling classes, the, 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 um, the actions of our ruling classes abroad is, is also opposed to the interests uh, of, the, of, of, of the domestic uh, working class. The bourgeois use propaganda, war propaganda. They use, they, 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 they abuse the genuine humanity that everyone feels for war victims. And then they try to, to divert their attention and to rally the people behind the ruling class, behind their own uh, uh, projects. Our task is to draw out and clarify the class uh, contradictions at every step of the way in all of the work uh, that, that we're doing. The same people who exploit the workers and oppress the workers in the West are the ones who are going out there and trying to oppress and exploit workers uh, 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 in the rest of the world. And they're the same people who are sending young Ukrainian uh, men uh, to, to die, and all, now also women, because they're, they're, they're beginning to mobilize massively amongst women, um, to die for their narrow interests and, no, and, nothing, uh, and nothing else. Um, and we need to explain this. And we need to explain that as long as the imperialists remain in power, there will be endless wars. 
There will always be wars as long as the imperialists uh, remain power. And for us, a defeat of Western imperialism is a good thing. A defeat of the West in the Ukraine and everywhere else is a good thing because it will accelerate the crisis of the ruling class at home. Um, of course, what about Putin, some people will say. Who's going to fight against Putin and who's going to fight against uh, Russia's war? But the, the point is that is the task of the Russian working class, the Russian communists. That's the, 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 they have to fight their main enemy, which is their own uh, ruling class. And in fact, the fact is that this war by the West, NATO's actions have strengthened the Putin regime. A lot of, a lot of, most Russian workers do not want war. They don't want this war either. They're not, they're not particularly fond of it. They're not particularly fond of the regime either. However, they remember the 90s. They remember what the West did in the 90s and how they dismantled the Soviet economy and how they would walk around, treat, treat Russia like, you know, humiliate them essentially. Uh, hundreds of thousands of Russians died or you know, had, to, had to go from a relatively high living standard to living in the most barbaric, destitute conditions. And the West wants to do the same thing again. The West wants to push Russia back into this. And r ordinary Russians see that and they understand the threat that NATO and the West poses to them. They see that, for instance, you know, the, the, some parts of the Western ruling class even are talking about decolonizing Russia. What, is, what does it mean, decolonizing Russia? It means dividing up Russia into the, all of its different nationalities. Russia is a big patchwork of different nationalities. What, what would that mean? A breakup of Russia along national lines would mean, would mean the most reactionary sectarian civil wars you can possibly imagine. We should go on for years and years and years. The Russian workers do not want that. And therefore, the, 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 the attack, the Putin, the Putin regime uses the actions of the West to rally the Russian nation behind himself, to dilute class contradictions in Russia, to say essentially, let we, yes, okay, we might have differences, but this enemy is a bigger one, is a more important one. Let's all unite to fight the West. Let's all unite to fight NATO. We must, we must uh, d defend ourselves and our, and our fatherland. In other words, he, he, um, he does the same thing that the, that the ruling classes in the West does, using uh, his own, you know, using this war in order uh, to, to, to dilute class contradictions. And it's the task of the Russian Marxists and the Russian communists to, to highlight that again, to explain, to expose what Putin is doing essentially. Say, no, you're actually, you're not fighting for, for the, in defense of the interests of the Russian masses, but only in the interests of the tiny group of oligarchs that you um, uh, represent. And in fact, Western Marxists opposing our ruling class is a help to the Russian workers. You see, as it is now, Putin can say, look, everyone in the West hates us. Everyone in the West is, is against us. They're even banning you know, Russian ballets and Russian music and Russian movies and Russian this and that. He uses that. But if the Western workers can say, we have no interest in dominating you, we're going to fight against our own ruling class. We're going to fight against Western imperialism so that they have no way of harming you and, and subjugating you. Well, then that, that allows class contradictions to, to, to crystallize uh, uh, much faster and much clearer in Russia itself. And that way, the Russian and the Western workers can, can join together and, and tie uh, the, the, the strongest links with one another. Um, and of course, the Russian, Russian, uh, uh, the, 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 the Russian um, communists also have to explain that they also want to fight NATO. But the only way to really fight NATO, how is that? is by taking power into their own hands and by uniting with the workers of the West. That is surely the best way of fighting U.S. imperialism and NATO imperialism, is by, 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 by uniting uh, with the workers across the world on both sides of this, uh, this struggle. And that's exactly what the bourgeoisie is trying to prevent. They want to divide workers along national lines. And our task, uh, uh, our method, by, by aiming first and foremost against our own ruling classes, is the best means of overcoming that. That is, that is the internationalist method of, uh, of, of communism. And of course, this has to be linked with the international struggle for socialist uh, revolution. Now, I have to sum up now, but um, it's clear now that actually, you know, as Joe said, they've been talking about the impending victory and, you know, the Ukraine is going to be next to Moscow and the Russian army is so decrepit and it's so weak and it's going to... But actually, they're losing now. The Ukrainians are 
you know, sprinting towards a defeat. You've had in the last week alone, several articles in very prominent papers, Times Magazine, The Economist, uh, in NBC, coming out, showing a very, very different picture than, it, than the one has been showed uh, previously. They show Zelensky completely isolated as the only person, almost like a madman, <laughs> as the only person who believes in a, a, in a victory when everyone else is saying, this, this cannot go on. Then you have Zaluzhny, who is the head of the Ukrainian army, uh, appearing in an interview in The Economist without the clearance from, from, from Zelensky, by the way, saying that, essentially saying this war is lost. He calls it a stalemate, but the way that he poses it, actually saying, it is impossible to, we cannot say any longer that this war is not winnable by Russia, some, something like that. But if you add up all the double negatives, you end up saying we have lost. Right? Um, and um, yeah, and, and the whole house of cards is kind of, uh, collapsing. Now that is a huge blow to US imperialism, to Western imperialism, which as I said is the most reactionary force on the planet. Why is it that? It's the biggest capitalist uh, nation, it has the biggest economy, and economically it's, it's, it's uh, how do you say, tapped into every single country one way or another, either directly or indirectly, controls the whole financial system, major industries, everything is controlled by, 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 by U.S. Uh, capitalism, essentially. <laughs> There's not a single country where the U.S. does not have direct uh, ec economic or political interest that it doesn't use to manipulate and steer those countries uh, it, to, towards its own aims. And furthermore, in order to maintain this position, it has the strongest military power force on the planet. A military which, in budgetary terms, is, ten, is, is as big, is bigger than the next 10 militaries have put together. It had hundreds of military bases all over the world. Essentially, this, this is a superpower. This is a massive, massive superpower. Uh, and in every country, every time you see any indication of a mass movement, of a genuine revolutionary proletarian mass movement, U.S. imperialism will scheme and will do everything in its power to undermine that. Whether it's in the friendly country, in a friendly country, allied country, or, or an enemy country, they will do whatever they can to stop the working class from coming to power. And therefore, obviously, a defeat of U.S. imperialism is a big event. And for the vast majority of the workers in the world, it's a, it, it will be a, a, a step forward. It will be a, a victory. For the Russian workers, it will not, because it will temporarily strengthen the Putin regime. It will, it will strengthen also the Chinese regime temporarily because they, they are in competition and they portray themselves as being in opposition to the, to, 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 to the Americans. But this will have a huge impact. And most importantly, inside the U.S. itself, in the West itself, it will massively accelerate the political crisis of capitalism that we've seen, and, and in turn also the economic and so forth, that we've seen over the past uh, decade. And it will have an impact on the, on the class struggle as well. But does that mean then that we support Russia and China? That's because that's what, what some people think. They say, oh, they see the hypocrisy. They see what the role that the Americans are playing. They see the, the, you know, the, the, the barbarism that they're spreading everywhere. And they say, well, Russia and China are the only ones uh, fighting back. And they're actually winning. That's actually happening. They are actually winning. They're, they're gaining at least, let's put it like that. The US is still by far the biggest imperialist power. But Russia and China are putting in some, some, some good punches, let's put it like that. Um, and they, and the, there's this idea that, oh, it's much better to have a multipolar world, a, a world with many imperialist powers that can kind of balance each other out. And this will create a more stable world, a, a world, a more just world. That's absolutely incorrect. First of all, Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping in, in China are not in any way, shape or form progressive. You, you just have to look at the regimes that the Russians support and the Chinese support all over the world to see what kind of uh, people we're dealing with. Uh, the Iranian regime, not in any way a, rea a progressive regime. Uh, the Syrian regime, the Turkish regime, these are the friends of these people. Uh, in fact, Israel, China, Russia, at the moment, they're, they're not doing very well, but the Russians have no problems co cooperating with the Israelis, even though at the moment they would like to, not to be seen um, too close to them. In Libya, they support a reactionary government uh, uh, of, of Eastern uh, Libya, the Haftar government. In Sudan, they support the RSF tribal militias, extremely reactionary forces for their own interests. 
we have nothing in common with them and we in no way, shape or form can give them any support. Most importantly, they are the enemies of the Russian and Chinese workers at home. And if we are in any way seen as supporting them, that means we're, 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 we're supporting their rule in Russia and China. We're supporting their exploitation and, and oppression of the Russian uh, and Chinese uh, working class. And furthermore, the decline of US imperialism, yes, there is a progressive side to it in the sense that when you have a declining imperialist power, the, the space is open for, for mass movements also to erupt. But in reality, what, it, what it's gonna lead to is incre incredible amounts of instability. That's what we're seeing in, in the Middle East. That's what we're seeing in, 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 the, in Israel and Palestine. Essentially, that's part of a, uh, a symptom Partially, on one, one angle of one side of it, is that it's a symptom of a declining power of U.S. imperialism. And we're going to see this I increasingly. In more and more places, you're going to see wars and, and uh, an extreme uh, instability uh, to come out. Um, yes. However, um, it will also, this instability will also affect um, uh, the, 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 the crash struggle. In essence, what we're seeing now is a new period that's opened up, we're already in the first stages of it, of a new period of extreme instability throughout the world, of wars and uh, revolutions and counter-revolutions and civil wars. Some of them reactionary, but also some of them uh, progressive. Some of them will be revolutionary uh, developments. And while some of the pacifists uh, and the liberals, they say, oh, now is a chance to put aside the struggle for socialism Let's just, let's just hope for, let's just fight for peace now. Let's all unite and fight for peace. We say, no, this is the true face of this, uh, of this system. What we're seeing now is the face of, you know, the, the nice face of capitalism of the post-war period of a relative calm and stability falling off and the real nature of this system coming up. And it's precisely at this point that we have to fight for socialism and the opportunities are going to be there because all of this instability will also politicize people. It will make them think. It will bring all of the contradictions to the surface. And our task is to prepare for that in order to bring it to its, to its final conclusion of destroying imperialism, destroying capitalism. And then we can lay the basis for a peaceful and harmonic world where people can coexist and, and, and collaborate for, for a better future for all. Thank you.